Hello all, welcome to our brand new daily show, The Big Story, where we bring you the hottest topics of the day right in the heart of the newsroom. I'm Rachel, coming to you live from The Straits Times. We are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, so make sure to like, comment and share with your friends. Also, do click on the bell when it, to be alerted whenever we are live. I have my newsroom colleagues joining me today to share about the topics that got you talking today. So, um, a gateway in Bali turned into a nightmare for a couple last week. Mr. Eugene Atta and his wife, Ms. Dolly Ho, were robbed, hospitalised and harassed during their four-day vacation in Bali. They were on a rented scooter when two men on a motorcycle snatched her phone and kicked the scooter. The couple fell off. Ms. Ho suffered a fractured shoulder, concussion and memory loss. Another man took off with the rented scooter. I have travel writer Lee Siu Hua in the studio with me today to share her tips on navigating holiday nightmares. Welcome to the show, Siu Hua. Thank you. So Siu Hua, people think of vacation as a time to relax and unwind, but you know, going abroad has its challenges as well. Can you share with us some tips on handling uh, challenges when one is abroad? One quick tip would be to learn to say help in the local language, right? It's almost like a nature for us to learn to say hello in the local lingo, to break the ice or to say that's expensive while bargaining. But what about help? Help me. This will hopefully stun the attacker, the bad guy, or and give hopefully a good guy, the good Samaritan will show up and do the rescue. Mm, okay. So we know that the couple um, bought travel insurance and Miss Ho, she had a doctor escort her back uh, to Singapore because of what they've been covered in the insurance. What can uh, some of the viewers uh, look out for when they buy travel insurance? Yeah. First, cheap is not always good. There are so many affordable options out there online, but it's uh, can, you can consider the length of the vacation for a start. So a month long holiday in South America versus a weekend getaway in Hong Kong. Um, for a long trip, a month or more, there'll be more chances for things to go haywire. So make sure there is sufficient coverage. Yeah, and um, another point might be that uh, to know yourself, uh, who you're traveling with, let's say it's a three generation family holiday. That's very popular. Um, look across a family to see whether there is suitable coverage, especially for the youngest and the most elderly. Yeah. Um, and ask a few more questions to see what comfort level you need for insurance cover. So, um, are you, so in this day of uh, terror attacks, uh, would you want to buy more peace of mind with, cov with full coverage against terrorist attacks? Also ask, do I have pre-existing medical conditions? Or what sort of travel am I if I am uh, an adventure lover? You know, I think, uh, try to go for the max. So I've interviewed a very frequent traveler who's been to like 140 countries and territories and he was relating how he was on a Himalayan trek and he climbed too fast basically and he got water in his lungs he his guide had to call in a helicopter so the chopper ride to Kathmandu in Nepal might have cost like um, US ten thousand dollars but because of his coverage was taken care that was taken care of and he said he also enjoyed near luxury in, um, in, in his own room, pretty much five star. It was so well taken care of that uh, he could restart his track after three days, you know, continue his adventure, very gutsy. Yeah. Mm, okay. And you know, we can't talk about travel insurance without talking about claims, you know, in uh, very unforeseen circumstances where, you know, you really need to claim for something. Um, what kind of things that a traveller can do to prepare themselves before a holiday in terms of, let's say, they need to make this claim? Right. Let's say something similar to the um, what happened to the Singaporean couple in Bali occurs, you no, know, sadly. Um, in, this, in this frenzy of that moment, uh, the traveller will be traumatised but can still try to remember 
three things. Yeah. Make a police report, mm. contact the insurer and seek help from the embassy. But also remember that the embassy may not be in the country. Yeah. So um, prepare this in the mind first. And uh, travel experts seem to have this consensus that among these three things, try to prioritise the police report. Why? Because it is not just uh, to be safe and to have well-being um, for the distressed traveller, but we also need the solid written evidence of what happened, you know, robbery, car accident, whatever, um, so that a claim can be made, insurance claim can be made in, at the right time. Yeah. I would say for the um, insurance part, um, practically it will be good to store the telephone number of the 24-hour emergency hotline in the contact list of your mobile phone. Mm. Also have your travel insurance policy handy and, and also download the insurance app because uh, so much resources are now put into apps so that would, uh, from beginning to end you would have quicker access to your policy plus at the end of it um, submit the claim more you know smoothly yeah finally as a travel writer i like to say keep traveling yeah um, i go on trips five times eight times ten times a year depending on the year and i've seen how i'm a planner i've seen how my best, most meticulous plans have unspooled in a flash. So personally, I have dropped my wallet in a cab in Santiago, the capital of Chile. I, have, I had thought I would drown uh, while doing stand-up paddle, stand paddle boarding on Sumba Island on the far edge of Indonesia. Um, but Singaporeans are great travel lovers. Mm. Yes, and travel is one of the best pleasures of life, it's transforming. So, you know, get out there, keep traveling and keep safe. Uh, you're making me want to travel now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so for viewers out there, make sure to get travel insurance for a more peaceful holiday. Thank you, Siu Hua, for sharing your tips with us today. So up next, NUS has been criticised for how they've been handling sexual misconduct cases. This came to light after Monica Bay took to Instagram to talk about how NUS disciplined an undergraduate who filmed her while she was showering. Over the past three years, there have been 25 incidents of sexual offences reviewed by NUS Board of Discipline. None of the students were expelled. Education Minister Ong Ye Kung had called NUS's second strike and you are out policy manifestly inadequate. In response to heavy criticism from students and the public, a committee was set up to review the current frameworks handling sexual misconduct cases. I have education correspondent Amelia Ting with me in the studio today to discuss NUS's new proposed guidelines in handling sexual misconduct cases and mainly whether these new guidelines are adequate. Welcome to the show, Amelia. Thank you. So, Amelia, can you share with us uh, what are some of these new proposed guidelines that NUS rolled out? So NUS is looking at um, stricter penalties, um, namely expulsion, a possibility for severe offences. They're also looking at longer suspensions, so a minimum of a year-long suspension away from school. Um, they're also looking at a notation, uh, which is a record on the student's transcript, and this stays on the transcript um, after graduation as well, and will be disclosed to um, employers for internships or for jobs. Um, they are also looking at a, cer a certificate of rehabilitation, which would mean that uh, an offender would need to be certified by a medical professional or counsellor before being permitted to go back to school after a suspension or an expulsion after a few years. Okay. So we know um, these are just proposed guidelines. Uh, are they engaging students in you know, creating the actual guidelines in the coming few weeks? So they are indeed, um, over the next three weeks, uh, they will be seeking the input from students, staff and even alumni um, to gather their input on the sanctions that they have proposed to ask them for their views about sexual misconduct on campus as well. So they have also commissioned um, a research consultancy to do an online survey for the entire student body and this will be to look at you know, the students' views and it's a rather significant step because it's the first time that they're looking at um, a, a, a large-scale survey of this sort. 
Mm, okay, and you know, since the sexual misconduct case in NUS came to light um, about in April this year, uh, what are some steps that NUS has taken to increase security on campus? So they have taken rather swift action. Um, the first thing they did when the news broke was to immediately ramp up security on campus. Uh, physical infrastructure was improved, um, so they are in the process of adding um, security guards, patrols in the, at their hall facilities. They are also in the process of installing at least 300 extra CCTV cameras. Uh, this will be at the shower cubicles in halls as well as the sports facilities. They are also making um, the shower facilities more secure in terms of sealing off the top and bottom of the cubicles. Um, but you know, even amidst all this discussion, um, there's still perpetrators, you know, on campus. So another case broke of another NUS student who, a 26 year old, who was charged recently and was um, charged because of filming of another female schoolmate who was showering on campus at Raffles Hall. Mm. Okay. So this time, fortunately, his act was caught um, by a new CCTV, t CCTV camera that was recently installed. Mm, okay, so you can Kind of, we can see that you know the guidelines are even more urgent right now. Um, do you have any updates on what are the reactions on the ground on these guidelines? So the general reaction from students, from uh, members of the public, and parents as well is that the harsher penalties are the right thing to do, um, as they reflect the severity of the offences, sexual offences in particular. So as a parent told me yesterday, um, he, he has a twenty-two year old. A daughter in NUS, and he was saying that you know what's the difference between uh, an undergrad who is past 21 years old and has committed a sexual offence on campus versus a working adult who is you know even 25 or 24 um, and does an indecent act um, you know at work or in a public place. There shouldn't be a difference. I mean, to him. Okay. Yeah, and also you know the university is saying that. Is considering expulsion for severe offences. Uh, people are asking, you know, what is considered severe? Um, is sexual voyeurism considered severe, uh, as opposed to you know, outrage of modesty where there's physical touch involved? Um, is filming and peeping the same level as filming, but uh, peeping but not filming? So there are many different things that uh, details that they need to iron out over the next three weeks before they make their final report. Um, in by mid June, mm. um, so at the same time, the students have also called for the university to not just you know dish out punishments, um, and come up with disciplinary fr frameworks, but to also do its part as an academic institution to educate. You know that's its primary job, and to educate the student community on you know basic values like uh, respect, uh, consent. Which we, which are values that we presume everyone has, uh, but uh, sometimes they're often neglected or be, you know, they're o overlooked. Mm. And for offenders, you know, besides just serving out the punishment that they are given, um, there's also a real need to help them uh, in the long term, not just to you know for them to to be suspended or to be expelled. But what happens after that? Um, I think there's also this urgent need to help them reflect on their actions, what they have done wrong, um, to help them truly rehabilitate back to society and to repent, um, so that there, there wouldn't be repeat offenders. Mm, okay, and hopefully in the coming few weeks, the student engagement with the university will allow them to iron this out better, right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. So over the next three weeks, I think we'll expect more uh, details to be given out. And then um, hopefully the June report will be made public so that we can all uh, understand what's going on and how not just NUS but all the other universities in Singapore also can learn from this whole experience. Okay, thank you Amelia for sharing your insights on this matter. Amelia will continue to follow the story on NUS proposed guidelines on sexual misconduct cases. So keep your eyes on the Straits Times to be updated. So there we have it, uh, the top stories of the day. For more news and stories, do log on to straightstimes.com. Once again, I'm Rachel. Join me again tomorrow um, for the news on the big story.